extraordinary stories in boxing, but none more remarkable than that of Johnny Tapia. Back in my days on ESPN, I chronicled his rise, his fall, and then his rise again to become a world champion. Johnny had a complicated life filled with some great accomplishments and some great sorrows. Albuquerque's favorite son left us way too soon at the age of 45, but his boxing brilliance, his effervescent personality, and his genuine kindness left a huge imprint not only on boxing, but also on everyone he met in his journey through life. He will be missed. This June, Albuquerque laid to rest their hero and champion, Johnny Tapia. With over 7,000 in attendance, it was a fitting tribute to a man who valued love above all else. Admired for his honesty and enthusiasm, we remember Johnny Tapia in his own words. Mi vida loca. I'm Johnny Tapia and I'm a fighter. I've been through hell and back. Well, I was born and raised in Albuquerque and I really love it there. When I was seven, my mom was, uh, she was stabbed 21 times with an ice pick and also raped. They found like a, a chain that my mom used to use in the hospital and that's when they found out it was my mom. I was raised with no love and it's hard to get it now. With me growing up as a kid, I did all wrong. All I wanted somebody to tell me is that I was okay. I'm gonna be all right. My brother Randall used to challenge me with other little kids. They tell me fight this guy, fight that guy. If I beat him up, I get a dollar. So I fight everybody for a dollar. I was always a little scrapper, you know. I tried boxing and uh, when I came 11 years old, I won my first fight, I got a knockout in 30 seconds. And since then, I never stopped. Here is the pride of Albuquerque, Johnny Tapia. I mean, everything has happened out of the ring in my life. But in the ring, I'm at peace. There's nothing they can do to me. With tremendous heart, what a left hook there by Tapia. You know, I'm used to fighting down the streets and not getting hit by one person. This is a one-to-one -one thing. It's just me and him. You give me a black guy, break my nose, it's like, I don't care. Come on, break, give me another black guy. I want to give them what they want to see. It's the higher you get, the lonelier it is. When you become a celebrity, things come at you from every direction. If you don't know how to control it, why are you going to go in the wrong way? Well, you know my life. You know what I've done in my life. Everybody knows what I've done in my life. But I don't blame nobody, and I never will. I blame everything on me, and as Johnny Tapia takes the whole vault. A message to the kids to say, you know, all over the world, if you've never tried drugs, don't do it. First time's a mistake, second time's a habit. Please, don't do it. But I'm glad I got a beautiful family that stick by me through thick and thin, because there's nothing else like your family. I couldn't do nothing without my wife, Teresa. I gotta have her there. She's my angel. She's my protection. She's been through a lot with me. She just always wanted to get my life together, and I knew if I would listen to her, I would have something. Losing everybody loses, and she gets herself back up. And there's no such thing as I can't. I can say now in my life, I had it all. I don't want nobody to know me as a champ. I want them to know me as a person. And a lot of people do, and they love me that way. All it takes is just love. Tell somebody that you're okay, you're gonna be all right. And that's priceless. What's a hug and a kiss? That's more than a million dollars. What I really got in life is I got love. I've never had it before. And man, does it feel good.
had quite the, the roller coaster ride. I'm surprised it's not a theme park. <laughs> It has been a tumultuous 14-month ride for Victor Ortiz, one that began with an exhilarating high. First off, I fight Berto, become champion of the world, and then I fight Mayweather. I start taking some elbows here and there. I do the biggest mistake of my career. I threw a headbutt. It's my first time I ever get dirty like that. I looked at Floyd, dude, I'm sorry, man. I take a step back, boom, I get hit. I look at the referee, boom, it's over. I'm like, what just happened? Looking for redemption, Ortiz accepted a rematch with his nemesis, Andre Berto. Don't kiss me now. But a postponement, then a cancellation. See that? Steroid free. Left Ortiz inactive for the last nine months. It kind of felt like a racehorse, but there was no race. In steps Jose Cito Lopez, a tough last minute replacement. I'm in the same position that he was years ago, and I'm hungry. The loss is not an option. In tonight's main event, it's Ortiz versus Lopez. As the roller coaster ride continues for Victor Ortiz. That's tonight on Showtime Championship Boxing. In late spring, downtown Los Angeles was home to multiple playoff games of not just the NBA's Lakers and Clippers, but also the surprise Stanley Cup champion, LA Kings. Only 12 days ago, right here at the Staples Center, the Kings defeated the New Jersey Devils in six games to win their first ever NHL championship. And the fans came out in force to salute their heroes in a celebratory parade. One of the country's most popular venues is Staples Center. No pucks here tonight, though, and a different type of power play. We have a pair of big fights, and both have significant implications. In our main event, Walter Wade, Victor Ortiz, the winner of 2011's Fight of the Year, returns to the ring for the first time in nine months for a pivotal matchup against the hungry Josecito Lopez. In 2010, the winner of the fight of the year was Humberto Soto. And in our opening fight tonight, the Mexican warrior takes on one of boxing's biggest punchers, Argentina's Lucas Matisse, in a significant fight in the super lightweight division. It promises to be a wicked war. Hello again, everybody. Gus Johnson here in Los Angeles. And boxing, no fighter advances in a straight line. But Victor Ortiz has been on a dizzying roller coaster ride. Ortiz is a fighter with unmistakable star appeal because both inside and outside the ring, he's consistently created drama. He's sometimes been inspiring, he's often been unpredictable, and he's almost always been compelling. Now, after a 14-month stretch that has included a scintillating win, a bizarre and devastating loss, and the cancellation of a critical rematch, Ortiz returns to the ring begging the question, what could possibly happen next? Happy to be joined now by my Hall of Fame partner, Al Bernstein, and uh, what a ride for Victor Ortiz. Oh. He's been off for nine months. <clears throat> We don't know what to expect for, from him, but for Josecito Lopez, this is a huge opportunity. It really is, and ironically, he last fought when Victor Ortiz fought in September uh, 17th of 2011. Now, both men would lose that night, but the losses were quite different. For the 27-year-old Lopez, it was a fight in which he fought extremely well against Jesse Vargas, an undefeated, and some think a potential champion in 140 pounds. Now, that fight was at 
140. Tonight, he will move up to 147 to face Ortiz, about a year earlier than he anticipated making that move up. Make no mistake, if you've not seen Lopez fight, he's a very solid fighter. He's only been off his feet once in his career. That a flash knockdown against Wes Ferguson. This is a solid B-level fighter who wants to move up to A tonight. Now, as for Ortiz, that loss he had back in September, well, the image of his mistake against Floyd Mayweather Jr. and his demise that night feeds him to do big things in the future in boxing. And he hopes that emotional roller coaster we've talked about comes to an end tonight with a decisive win over Lopez and one that will ensure him a chance in September in a very big fight against Canelo Alvarez. All right, so another stellar lineup ahead here on Showtime Championship Boxing. Now, we've got a great... Facebook poll question for you tonight, especially when you consider what's taking place in boxing with some judging problems in the Bradley Manny Pacquiao contest. But have the internet and social media created more controversy regarding the scoring of fights? Cast your vote, yes or no. Visit our Facebook page right now. We'll bring you the results later tonight. Showtime Sports is a leader in integrating social media with our viewers, and here's another way to interact with tonight's telecast. Showtime Sports brings you the biggest fights. Now get in the game with Showtime Split Decision. Go to sd.sho.com on your iPhone or Android to get started. First, predict the outcome of the fight, then score each round live. Post your predictions to Facebook and follow the conversation on Twitter. Earn points by matching the official judges' scorecards and for all correct predictions. Plus, you'll be entered into a grand prize drawing for a trip to a Showtime boxing event. Play the game June 23rd watching Victor Ortiz versus Jose Cito Lopez. Sign up and get ready to score. Two division former world champion Umberto Soto has been one of boxing's most consistently exciting fighter for years. His opponent Lucas Matisse has the highest KO percentage of boxing's top 140 pounders. This one could be special. It's Argentina versus Mexico. Lucas Matisse 30 and 2 28 KOs his only two losses split decisions against Zab Judah and Devin Alexander and those two trips to the United States needless to say could have gone better for him he fought extremely well in those fights and many believe he won both of those matches he had both of those opponents down in the fight he ended up losing as you said a very very close decision tonight he made it very clear to us Gus he does not want to leave it in the judges hands he wants to land one of those big right hands and score a knockout and Matisse telling us that he expects Soto to at least start off boxing. However, he's hot-blooded, and it will eventually turn into a war, and he's looking forward to it. Lucas Matisse, 29 years old, from Argentina, entering the ring. Making his ring walk now, Umberto Soto, a 14-year boxing veteran. He told us that he knows bigger fights are out there if he's able to defeat Matisse. And he said that with those bigger fights come bigger purses, and that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, at age 32, despite that length of career that you referenced, he feels he's in the prime of his career now. He's a two-time world champion. He is fighting tonight at the highest weight he's fought. He has fought a couple of fights at the 140 pound limit, but this is the highest he's been. And he comes in tonight as an underdog. And that is certainly something Humberto Soto is not used to. And it's, that fight he had against him, Urbano Antione in 2010 reminds us that as Matisse said, he can be in a brawl. All right, Al, with that in mind, let's take a look at the numbers as we go to the tail of the tape, Humberto Soto and Matisse. Many of the numbers are very similar. Now, Matisse is the true 140-pounder. Um, and so even though these numbers are the same, you have to assume Matisse has a little bit more overall strength. And at 32, 
after that 14-year career and a lot of wars, is Humberto Soto getting long in the tooth? And the unified rules for tonight's bouts. Well, there's no standing eight. Uh, of course, no three knockdown rule. The referee or doctor can stop the fight. And uh, if there is a clash of heads and the fight would be stopped uh, before the fourth round, uh, they would. Uh, it would be a no contest after that. They would go to the scorecards. So we're ready for our first fight of the evening on Showtime Championship Boxing. Let's go inside the ring for the official introductions from Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to Staples Center here in Los Angeles, California, as we have a big night of action coming your way, brought to you by Golden Boy Promotions and Showtime, and sponsored by Corona Extra, La Cerveza Mas Fina, DeWalt Tools, and their new 20-volt Max Brushless technology. They are guaranteed tough and AT&T, the nation's largest 4G network, AT&T Rethink Possible. This bout coming away is presented in conjunction with Baja Boxing Promotions and Arana Box Promotions. It is sanctioned by the WBC, President Jose Suleiman, Supervisor Rudy Tejas. Introducing to you our three judges, all from the state of California, from Calabasas, Barry Druxman. From Huntington Beach, Dr. James Jenkin, and from Chula Vista, Alejandro Rochin. And introducing our referee in charge of the action, he'll be giving instructions after the introductions, Raul Kais. All right, fans, here we go. Ten rounds of boxing scheduled for a world title eliminator and the vacant WBC Continental America's Super Lightweight Championship. Introducing to you first, on my right, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing light blue trunks, hailing from Trelew, Chubut, Argentina. He weighed in at 138 and three quarter pounds, and his hard hitting record stands at 30 wins, two losses, one no decision, with 28 big wins coming by way of knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the hard hitting WBC number four ranked super lightweight in the world. World. Introducing Lucas Matisse. And his opponent across the ring on my left, fighting out of the red corner, wearing silver trunks with yellow trim, hailing from Los Mochis, Sinaloa, Mexico. His weight, 139 and one half pounds. His record, 59 wins, seven losses, two draws, and one no decision, with 34 wins coming by way of knockout. Currently ranked the WBC number two super lightweight contender in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the two-time champion of the world, introducing Umberto Sorita. Once again, a referee in charge now to give instructions, Raul Kais. Pásale, Humberto. Lucas. Ok, señores, les di las instrucciones hacia abajo. Los dos traen el calzón un poquito alto, así que aquí, para los dos está perfectamente bien. Dense la mano. Buena suerte a los dos. ¿eh? So we are ready for our first fight of the evening on Showtime Championship Boxing. Matisse, only two losses to two terrific fighters. Two split decision losses to Zab Judah and Devin Alexander, who could be seen on Showtime later on this summer. He knows this is a terrific opportunity. At 29 years old, he's an eight-year pro. Humberto Soto. Ranked number two in the WBC, number three in the WBA, number seven in the WBO. Bigger fights, bigger paydays ahead, but he's got to take care of business right now here in downtown Los Angeles. Look Gus up, Johnson, Al Bernstein, Jim Gray, up. Heidi Andral from Staples Center. And round one scheduled for 10 in the super lightweight division. Most people that know me know I'm not big on hyperbole. I'm not big on making predictions. I think this could be a fight of the year candidate. 
Alberto Soto in 2010. The winner of the fight of the year. And according to both fighters, Matisse from Argentina saying, Mexican fighters are warriors. Mexican fighters have hot blood. I know when I get in there, it will be a war. I will not allow the judges to rob me of this victory this time. Similar to, in his opinion, what took place when he fought both Zab Judah and Devin Alexander. Round one's important to Matisse. Uh, Soto's getting off to a little bit quicker start, and Matisse has been known to start slowly. And very important, Soto requested that this be a 10-round fight instead of a 12-round fight, and Matisse acquiesced to it. And I would think, because in the Judah fight, he wanted, or the Devin Alexander fight, he wanted a 12 so he could get him later. I'm surprised Matisse acquiesced so easily to that. Soto's been busier, and even though those punches, a lot of them are blocked, Matisse has been very economical with his punches. Matisse, though, with very heavy hands. Second time he pulls Soto's head down. This is a lot of warning for not much that happened, to be honest. I mean, really. Lucas Matisse, 28 KOs, 32 with one no decision, 30 and two with one no decision. Great combination work by Soto. He's a superb combination puncher. Lucas Matisse, in his spare time, he's a tattoo artist. As a matter of fact, many of the tattoos that you see on the front of his body, he did himself. Pretty good job, too. Not I'd like to see you do that, Alex. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to get Matisse to do one of them. <laughs> you know, that this has been a good round for Humberto Soto. It, it's what he wanted, but there's that nice hook by Matisse. But a very active round for Soto. Scheduled for 10 rounds. Super lightweight. And the end of round one. And that brings us to the keys for this fight. For Lucas Matisse, uh, he's one of the best body punchers in the sport. Wasn't able to get too many of those in in round one, but he wants to go there. He must push Soto to the ropes. He did that in the middle of the, the round, but Soto wheeled away. And the right hand, that's the punch that puts Judah and Alexander down. He wants to land that punch. For Humberto Soto, we saw evidence of his combination punching in round one. It was just excellent. And he's got quick hands at 32 or any age. And he's got to stay off the ropes. Umbrano Antion put him against the ropes in their 2010 fight and raked him over the coals. Must use angles, which he's doing in round one or did in round one. He's not standing right in front of Matisse. And for both of these gentlemen, who's the goal if they were to the winner, rather, of this fight. Who do they want to have a chance to step in the ring with next? Well, you know, I think they, the winner of the Danny Garcia and Mira Khan fight certainly would look uh, enhancing to them. And uh, it's it's technically an eliminator fight for that title, but not exactly uh, because, no, we don't have a number one contender here. Now Soto moving his hands to start the second round. Matisse expects him to box mm. early. Now Soto. Stepping in. When Humberto Soto is sharp, and he's sharp right now, he is a handful. Now, now Matisse starts slow, and he can change this fight with one punch. There's no question about that. Right now, the hand speed of Soto is bedeviling him. And by the way, these are two men, in all the wars they've been in, they have never been down as a pro. Matisse has not thrown the right hand very much. That's his big power punch. 
Ok, está. Break, calmadito los dos. Some people feeling that Soto will get the decision tonight because of his boxing abilities. Well, and that's possible, but they have to remember that he often stops and starts to trade. We'll see if that's the case tonight. Soto's having a good second round again. There's that uppercut by Soto. It's one of his many punches in his arsenal. If you're Matisse, fighting a 14-year, 32-year-old, very highly skilled <clears throat> Soto who's been in numerous wars, what do you do? What should your strategy be, especially since he doesn't have as much time, only 10 rounds? That's his strategy, yes, you're right, Gus. Get him against the ropes. But Soto wheeled off those ropes and got his distance, and now he is wailing away with those combinations. Looks like that right hand may have hurt Matisse, backed him up, wobbled him a bit. Raul Caiz is, I gotta be honest, he's way, way too active in this fight. He is imposing himself and mostly against Matisse right now. He needs to chill and let him fight. Matisse advancing. Soto pivoting off the ropes. So far it's Soto as the Matador. Matisse has been aggressive, nice lead right hand connecting for Matisse. There you see the power punching, and that'll happen when he's against the ropes, Soto. Now Matisse trying to let his hands move, using the free hand inside. And the end of round two. Many offensive weapons for Humberto Soto. One of them is the uppercut. He's just a, a superb offensive fighter, and he has shown good hand speed against Matisse uh, throughout this fight. But Matisse, in the last 45 seconds of this round, made a lot happen, and right at the end of the round, in the last moment of the round, landed a big right hand. Now, that should not have been a knockdown in any case. He slipped, but there was a very good right hand in there. So Matisse changed the tenor of this fight right at the end of the round. This is the third round scheduled for 10 in the super lightweight division, actually for the fringe title, the vacant WBC Continental America's title. Humberto Soto is in the metallic and gold trunks, and Matisse in the baby blue. Soto from Mexico, Matisse from Argentina, straight right hand in the midsection, backs up Soto. And that's what Matisse wants to do more of. Uh, he really wants to get to that body. And it is true right now, Soto is boxing, he's being a boxer puncher, but when he goes to the ropes there and gets whacked with those body shots, that's where Matisse wants to make something happen. You can feel this fight shifting slightly. Matisse is getting his rhythm. Soto is not moving as much. Matisse, oh, another right hand, square on the chin. Matisse trying to close the distance. <laughs> Has let his hands go in the last two rounds. After a slow start, now Soto trying to dig with the left hook. Uppercut left hook by Matisse, grazing. Wow, oh man. Straight right hand connecting Matisse. Here we go, in LA. I told you, this one's gonna be a war, however long it lasts, and they have never been down as a pro. Neither man. Soto sticking. Matisse closing, loading up. The body work of Matisse is very important. He is really committed to it in this round. In addition to landing those big headshots. A minute remaining in the third round, scheduled for 10 in the super lightweight division. The overhand right from Matisse is getting there much more in this round. Oh, nice left hook getting through. 
Humberto Soto has got quick hands and good combinations when he throws them. As you take a look at the power punches this round. See the edge goes to Matisse. Some of those are thunderous body punches, some of those overhand rights. See, now Soto, look at him. He's getting caught on the ropes a lot more, and that is something he didn't want to do. Right hand, left hook underneath by Matisse. Three punch combination, actually five punch combination by Soto. Beautiful. Five seconds remaining in the third. And they are dancing in L.A. You gotta love this. Yes. Lucas Matisse's signature punch is that overhand right. There it comes. And it's, you can see when he's on the ropes, Umberto Soto, he's much more vulnerable to that. But there was some great action in that round, and Umberto Soto got more than his share of things done as well. Good left hook, but he takes a right hand, does Soto. It is interesting, you know, both men are doing what they do well. And um, right now, it's a very close fight and a very, very interesting one. Lucas Matisse comes from a boxing family, folks. Not only his dad and his brothers, but his mother, Doris. How about that? She had a one amateur fight. His sister fights right now. And you just wonder, when there are arguments in the Matisse family, it Whoa. could be a broken glass everywhere. If they had a dog, he would box. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> Fourth round of 10 okay, so saca, in the saca, super saca. lightweight division. The veteran, Humberto Soto, 32 years old, 14 year pro in the silver and yellow trunks. <clears throat> Matisse of Argentina in baby blue. Matisse considered the banger and Soto more of the technician. You know, three of the last five opponents that Matisse has fought have been left-handers. Three of the last five, yeah. And so he's happy to be in there against a right-hander, a conventional fighter. Matisse getting very close over the last three rounds. No knockdowns in this fight so far. Ooh, very good left hook follow. By a left hand to the body by Soto. Both fighters, Al, sitting on their punches yeah. early and often here. You're right, they're good. They're pronating their punches, they're getting power in them. And you look at how close that is in power punches. Big uppercut by Matisse, but you can see the tenor of this fight and the way it's going. These men are just both doing a superb job. Soto snapping the jab. Left hook by Matisse gets through. And then a beautiful right by uh, by a Soto as well. These men are just both doing what they do well. No wonder they decided to cut the two rounds at this <laughs> pace. You know what? You're right. Shouldn't make a fight 12. Oh, Soto stumbling. Oh, that right man hurt him. Left hook. Now underneath for Matisse. One of the important things that Matisse is doing is not forgetting to go to the body. He's in against a 32-year-old who's been in a lot of wars. That body work should pay dividends, even in a 10-rounder. We're only in round four. It just feels like round nine <laughs> in terms of what these men have done. Super Bantamweight champion Abner Mares tweeting from ringside. Abner 24-0-1 from Montebello, California. Local kid. We are very excited about at Showtime. Great fighter. You know, Soto's been 95 rounds in his last nine fights. Matisse's had 110 rounds in his whole career. So it shows you that uh, Soto's been in a lot of big fights and a lot of wars. Soto connecting with the up jab. Matisse backs up. He may have hurt Matisse. Matisse doesn't ever go backwards. Matisse, the uppercut has landed for him early in this fight. Now Soto, still busy. Man, nice.
Alberto Soto gets his left hook around the the, the guard, and that's a beautiful double left hook. Usually it starts to the body and goes to the head. He reversed it. And these are two fine fighters. And Umberto Soto might be one of the best technicians you, that isn't known as much as he should in boxing. There's Matisse, who's the power puncher of the two, landing some bombs. Not that Soto can't punch with power. But overall, a probably better round for Matisse who's more active. He, he threw 81 punches, landed 25. Soto landed 15. Tise refusing to sit down between rounds. The fifth round scheduled for 10 for the vacant WBC Continental Americas title in the super lightweight division. Lucas Matisse of Argentina in the baby blue and Humberto Soto in the metallic and gold shorts. And we are joined by super bantamweight world champion Abner Marez, who's just coming off a win over Eric Morrell as he moved up in weight. Abner, thank you very much for joining us. What do you think thus far of these two men? My pleasure. Great yeah. to be here. And what can I say, man? This is a great fight. It's, uh, it's barely the fifth round. And oh my God, I, I'm already tired of seeing these guys throw so much, man. It reminds us of you against Yanni <laughs> Perez or Joseph Egbeko. Both men doing what they do well you know Soto using his hand speed and Matisse using his power and his uh, his body punching I think they're both doing their they're sticking to their game plan uh, Soto yep. is a great technician great fighter but Matisse is just just so strong and and so confident with that you know with that he's confident with that uh, hard punches that he's got Abner you are a body puncher yourself and Matisse in this fight here in the fifth has delivered a lot of left hooks to the body on Soto. When does it really start paying dividends when you continue to go to the body on your opponent? Definitely after the sixth round. I mean, it's, it's already, um, you can already tell Soto's already uh, clinching. You can tell on his face, uh, he's feeling those body shots. You know, this round, Soto's done some very good work, but we've still got a minute and 19 left, and you made the point. Look, there he goes. Uh, with those good combinations, but Matisse always comes back with something strong, like that. Yeah, but I mean, Soto, he lets go, but you know, he stays there. He yes. stays there for Matisse to come back with something hard. And that's been the problem for Soto in these wars that he gets in, like the fight with Antione. It's a really good round. Right uppercut. There's another left hook to the body. Look at the deep breathing by Soto. Mouth open. Left hook. Oh, oh my. Matisse again, heavy punching. Matisse is the best body puncher in South America and one of the best body punchers in boxing. And he's showing it tonight. As Abner Mares, the world champion, said, after the sixth round is when we will see if those body shots really pay off for Lucas Matisse. Left hook, looping right hand, another left hook, another right hand, and Soto is hurt, and he goes down with the right hand. Can he get up? Wow, Matisse. Roberto Soto barely gets up to get out of the round. All right, get some air, get some air. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Look at me, look at me. How are you feeling? Give him air, give him air. Take a deep breath. Let's stop the fight. Let's stop the fight. We're going to stop the fight. He's going to stop the fight. I'm going to stop the fight. And they stop it. Lucas Matisse said he was not going to allow the judges to decide the outcome of this fight. He took care of business early on, and those body shots, Al Bernstein, Abner Mares, finally paid off. And you know, the thing that puts this in perspective is that Umberto Soto had never even been down as a pro. 
And the first time he goes down, he was hurt so badly by Matisse that his cornerman wisely stopped the fight. And it was the power of Matisse, who is usually a slow starter, against the combination punching of Soto, power one. Definitely start uh, really slow starter, but he really works that body and he hits hard upstairs. So I think that that's definitely what did it tonight. And a great corner from Sorita Soto. I mean, he was hurt. Uh, yes. The corner saw that and they didn't want to bring him out. Matt, uh, Matisse has knocked out now six of the last seven righties he has faced. And uh, to get knock out Humberto Soto was some accomplishment. From above, we will see how Lucas Matisse was able to do what no one's done before, and that is knock out Humberto Soto. An overhand right will be the big one. There's the punch that started the trouble for Soto, and that's the signature punch for Matisse. And yet another one sends him back. Then he was able to land yet a third, and had that third not been able to land, Soto might have been able to weather that at least to get through the round. But the third one landed, and when you're hit with three straight power punches from Lucas Matisse, you go down. But for a couple of glitches on the scorecards, Lucas Matisse would probably be undefeated right now, and some would argue should be undefeated, uh, saying that he beat Judah and Alexander. Raul Caiz sent him back to the corner after that, um, but he would not be able to answer the bell. The, again, we take a look at the overhand rights by Matisse. He knew that Soto was in trouble and he was able to get him down. Soto would beat the count, but Raul Caiz knew that they were at the end of the round, and so he sent him to the corner uh, where Soto's people hoped that one minute would give him enough uh, time. But, Abner, as we look at it again, these overhand rights, they're hard to stop when they're thrown like that and thrown with such power. They are, really. Uh, that's one of my favorite punches, actually. You do throw yeah. that, yes. <laughs> I like that punch. Uh, you don't see it coming. You don't see it coming. It's not a straight punch. It's an overhand right. Uh, you don't see it coming, but that definitely that straight right hand that dropped Salto right now, uh, that was it. That was. Uh, he actually bounced back from the ropes and got caught with that right hand. This young man has really had a long road to get to this point, Gus. So the tattoo artist from a family of boxers, including mom, dad, and sister, triumphant this evening here in Los Angeles, California, Lucas Matisse. And let's go into the ring where Jimmy Lennon Jr. is standing by. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout has been stopped at the end of round number five. A referee in charge, Raul Kais, stops the contest upon suggestion of the corner. He is the winner by way of knockout. He is the new WBC Continental America's super lightweight champion, Lucas Matisse. <laughs> Lucas Matisse. Stopping Humberto Soto, knocking him down for the first time in his career, stopping him for the first time in his career. Matisse told us, I will not allow the judges to decide this fight tonight. I'm going to take things into my own hands. It's going to be a war, and I will be victorious. You know, Matisse even out jabbed Soto, and that is rare for him to do that. And you see the power punches. So many of those 85 were to the body. You can see that Soto did some good work in this fight. There's no question about it. It was the difference in power that did it. And Jim Gray is standing by with Matisse. All right, Gus, thank you very much. Lucas, congratulations to you. You did not want to leave this in the hands of the judges tonight based on what has happened to you in your past. Yet you became the first man to knock out Soto. How did you accomplish this? Lucas, felicidades en el día de hoy. Eh, tú no lo querías dejar a los jueces. Tú querías ganar de la vía de knockout. Eh, ¿cómo, es, ¿Cómo lo hiciste? Eh, no, seguro. Sabíamos que teníamos que venir a ganar por knockout. Entrenamos muy duro acá junto a mi equipo. Así que bueno. Uh, with, the, with his team, he really uh, tried hard and worked hard during the training camp, and he knew he had to win by a knockout. How were you able to withstand the barrage by Soto earlier in this fight? Cuando comenzó duro Soto, ¿cómo lo conteniste? No, no, eh, la verdad que entré un poco eh, duro, nervioso, 
eh, pero es un excelente boxeador, la verdad que se movía muy bien, eh, tiene la, la mano muy dura, eh, pero bueno, sabíamos que, que metiéndole el ritmo eh, íbamos a poder llegar a este resultado. He started a little slow and it was a little nervous at the beginning, but then he took up the pace and he won the fight. Was this the best fight you fought? ¿Esta es la mejor pelea tuya? Sí, seguro. Eh, junto a la de Zap Suda y, y Alexander, sí, la mejor, porque esta vez no, no llegué a los jueces. <laughs> yeah, besides uh, Zap Judah and Devon Alexander, which he fought a great fight, he thinks it's the best one because it did not go to the judges. And what would you like to do now? Possibly Garcia or Khan, or, or do you have a thought on your next fight? Hey, ¿Tu próxima pelea contra quién quieres? Eh, quiero una oportunidad, cualquiera. Uh, he just wants an opportunity with whoever. Congratulations, it was fun to watch you this evening. Felicidades, Lucas. Muchas gracias. Thank Muchas you. gracias y gracias a los Estados Unidos por recibirme por convocarme esta vez otra vez, así que un saludo a toda Argentina. Thanks to all Argentina and the U.S. for having me. For the U.S. Uh, for having me today. Thank you. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Gracias. All right. And now, if I may, for just a moment, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about a very dear friend of mine and a very dear friend to the boxing world. I'm talking about Leroy Neiman, who passed away earlier this week at the age of 91 in New York City. He is survived by his wife, Janet. He was a world-renowned artist who had a very unique and unmatched ability to captivate and chronicle so many of the world's greatest sporting events. Not only sporting events, but pop culture, jazz, and he was the original Playboy artist. He's an international treasure and also an American original. One of the great joys in my life was the ability to spend so much time with Leroy at all of the great sporting events around the world from the Olympics to great fights, to the World Series, to the Super Bowl, and to see so many of the world's top renowned athletes literally beg Leroy to paint them. And then when he would agree, they knew that they had something special, that they would join a rarefied place. He was a wonderful and joyous man, and he lived a very, very full light. His art was what brought that good cheer to life. So now, as Leroy passes, there is a form of immortality to what he leaves behind because he has left so many of the world's great masterpieces. His brush is silent now, however, the indelible impression that he has left will live forever. Gus, I will miss him. The world has lost truly a great man. Back to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Well done. Very heartfelt from our Jim Gray. Uh, Leroy Neiman, I remember him as a child and the paintings of Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier that uh, my father would buy me as prints. Ah, he chronicled uh, the great moments of the sport. And speaking of great moments, we, we have certainly won this evening. And you see the judges' scorecards. Uh, don't, you know, don't be too uh, harsh on Dr. James Den Kin because I think that this could have been a 47-47 fight at the end. You see the fact that two of the judges giving uh, uh, Matisse the edge at the time of the stoppage, and uh, I would have had him ahead, but it was Soto got a lot done in this fight as well. All right, now let's go to the fourth member of our team. Standing by with a special guest, here's Heidi Andral. Thank you very much, Gus. Well, you know him as Sergeant Angel Batista on the hit show. Dexter joining me right now, David Zayas. Thanks for taking the time, David. Oh, thank you for having me. Heck of a fight right there. We've got another one coming up. I know you're a big boxing fan. Big boxing fan. Now, what do you expect and what interests you most in this Ortiz-Lopez fight? Well, what's, what's really interesting is that, you know, he's a replacement fighter, right. Lopez. So he's got nothing to lose. He's going to come on. It's going to be a great fight. And sometimes... When you train for a certain style, like Victor's been doing, right. now comes another fighter with a different style. The adjustment really determines what kind of fighter that is, and uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. But uh, Victor Ortiz is one of the best fighters around, and I think it's going to be an interesting and uh, a tough fight. So you're going Ortiz all the way? I, I have to say Ortiz all the way, yeah. All right, well, it's hard to believe six seasons going into the seventh season of Dexter already. Cliffhanger ending in season six. Yeah. What can we expect to see in season seven? Well, it's, it's, you know, I, I'll tell you that it's, it's going to be a bit darker. There's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people are going to have to deal with how season six ended, right. all the characters. It affects everybody. And uh, we got a very exciting uh, guest stars this year. And uh, it's going to be a fun, fun season. Any chance we'll see Sergeant Batista boxing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the mirror. There we <laughs> go. There we go. Well, you can check out Dexter September.
September 30th and premieres 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. It's only on Showtime. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank David. You. All right. Well, we've got much more to come and still to come. That main event, Victor Ortiz versus Josecito Lopez. And of course, Showbox, the new generation, returns with a special edition on Saturday, June 30th at 9 p.m. as IBF junior middleweight champ Cornelius Bundridge defends his title against former champion and number one contender Corey Spinks. In the co-featured bouts, Gary Russell Jr. fights Christopher Perez and Erislandi Lara takes on Freddie Hernandez. Now on Wednesday, July 11th at 10 p.m., it's the series premiere of the franchise, a season with the Miami Marlins. And of course, Strike Force is back in the cage Saturday, July 14th at 10 p.m. with another stacked lineup of highlighted by two championship fights. Luke Rockhold makes the second defense of his middleweight belt against U.S. Army Ranger Tim Kennedy. And undefeated Tyron Woodley fights Nate Marquardt with the welterweight title at stake. We'll have the prelim fights, of course, as always, on Show Extreme at 8 p.m. Saturday, July 28th at 10 p.m., Showtime Championship Boxing presents the interim WBC welterweight world title as Northern California's favorite son, Robert the Ghost Guerrero, fights Selchuk Iden. Preliminary fight coverage on Show Extreme starting at 8 p.m. And there's more Showtime Championship Boxing Saturday, August 11th at 9 p.m. when IBF light heavyweight titleist Tavoris Cloud defends his belt against former champion John Pascal. Well, we'll have the prelim bouts on Show Extreme as well, that time at 7 p.m. For more on Showtime Sports, visit our website at sports.show.com. Check out our Facebook page and, of course, follow us on Twitter. Let's now send it back ringside.